It's so nice to see you all here. I'm so happy to be here. My name is Andrew Franklin, if I haven't had the chance to meet you before. And it is my joy to welcome you to our Resurrection Sunday, our Easter services here at Highland Park Presbyterian Church. And we gather here on Easter, but also every single Sunday, because at one point in history, at the grave, at the tomb of Jesus, the words were spoken, he is risen. And that is why we get together every single Sunday in, in joyful celebration of that resurrection. It was a moment that changed history forever. And it was a moment that sin and death were defeated once and for all. And that is worth us gathering and joyfully singing and reading scriptures and hearing the word of God proclaimed in this fellowship of this church. It is all because Jesus was raised from the dead. Maybe you're here, it's your first time uh, worshiping with us at Highland Park Presbyterian Church, or maybe this is your church family and you're here all the time. Uh, the thing that unites us all is this common celebration and this acknowledgement that Jesus was raised from the dead. And it's worth admitting and acknowledging that there are some of you that might be here and you might not know what you believe about Jesus and you might not know what you think about this whole church thing. Or maybe it was like a clear exchange. If you want brunch, you got to come to church, right? Let's be real. It happens. This is Dallas. The brunch poll is strong. I get it. Uh, but seriously, if that is you and you are exploring faith and you're unsure what you think about Jesus, uh, we have something I would love to point out. It's called Alpha. It is a course that we have, and it's actually just starting in a few weeks. Alpha is an opportunity to uh, be together with other people asking similar questions, asking questions about faith and life and death and, and who is Jesus and what is the Bible and, and why do we pray? How do we pray? And so if you want to sign up for that and learn more about that, everything I'm mentioning is just here in this worship guide. And also, if you want to know more about who we are as a church and how to get connected, all of that can be found in this worship guide here. And I will ask us, if you are able, I'm going to invite us all to stand together. And I would like you to say as our call to worship, a, a call and response, these words that the church has been saying together for centuries. So the bold part where it says people, not to insult your intelligence, but that's you all, okay? And then um, would you say this with me? Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Christ is risen. Christ is the King of glory. So stand. Remain standing and let's continue to worship our resurrected King together. Can we sing this out together? The passion of our Savior. The mercy of our God, the cross that leaves no question of measure of his love. Come on, we sing, our chains are gone. Our chains are gone, our dead is paid, the cross has rolled. Oh, 
Gospel of Mark, chapter 16, 1 through 8. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so they might go to anoint Jesus. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go and tell the disciple, his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the woman went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Every year our Easter offering goes beyond these walls of this church into a world in need. And this year, you may have noticed that there is a war going on in the Ukraine. And so one of our mission partners, Convoy, Convoy of Hope, has been working on the ground in Ukraine, providing tangible relief to some of the most vulnerable in the war-toned country of Ukraine. Join me in watching this video right now. Right now we're working in Poland, bringing in relief supplies from Europe. 
year, every dollar will go to this organization, Convey of Hope. As other disaster and relief efforts go on, we're praying that today we may double the goal we've already hit. We, because of your generous generosity, we've already raised over $100,000. We hope today that we'd be able to double that. So you can give online, you can give by texting or dropping your gift in one of the offering boxes. Thank you for being a generous church. And now let's continue to worship as we are led in prayer. Easter is all the new friends and family um, that come together. And with that comes a lot of people. So I'm going to ask everyone, if you'd be willing, to get close and, may, and maybe open up some spots on, on the edges. So if everyone is willing, just come together a little bit. We have some extra people that are looking to come inside. So if you can, if you have an extra seat and want to uh, tighten up a little bit so we have some extra seats on the end, that would be great. Um, one of my other favorite things about Easter and, and celebrating the resurrection is that we, um, we can speak to a risen and a living person, um, a person who wants to hear us um, and a person who wants to act on our behalf. And so with that confidence, let's pray together. God, we first come to you in gratitude. We, we are beyond grateful that we stand here right now celebrating the resurrection of your son, Jesus Christ. Your word says that rarely will anyone die for a good and righteous person, but you, Jesus, died for us. In some way, you died for your enemies. It's our evil and our rebellious hearts, our tendency to disown you that puts you on the cross. Yet, while we were still sinners, you died for us. While we were still stuck in darkness, choosing ourselves over you, hurting our neighbors instead of loving them, you went to the cross and you conquered the evil that wreaks havoc in our hearts and this world. And you denied yourself for the sake of this world. And this Sunday, we celebrate not an idea or merely a hope or a philosophy or even just a metaphor, but we celebrate the reality that you conquered death, darkness, and evil once and for all on the cross. We celebrate new life, new birth. We celebrate redemption, restoration. We celebrate the healing your resurrection has brought to our lives, our relationships, and even this world. We celebrate the freedom we have in the powerful name of Jesus Christ, the abundant life you give us, the joy, the peace, and the love that we have. God, we celebrate resurrection this morning. Thank you, Lord. And we do acknowledge that we need this resurrection life in our own personal lives, in this city, and even around the world. So we think about the war in Ukraine would you bring new life to that situation? We pray specifically for the many Christians there, that you give them courage and boldness to proclaim the resurrection life in a way that provides real healing and help to those who are suffering and who are hurting. We pray for our partners there, that you would give them wisdom and guidance as they come to the side of those affected by this war. God, we also know that pain and suffering is not just a reality out there, but it's deeply present in this city and even in this room right now. And so we pray for those that are hurting, those who are aching for new life. We pray for the sick in our midst, those who just received a doctor diagnosis that they were not expecting. We pray for those that desire new life in relationships, whether that's a need for healing within a family or a friendship, provide your supernatural healing and peace for those people. And finally, we pray for those needing guidance and direction for those that have fear for what's next. Resurrection means that we are guided by a living person who goes before us and beside us wherever we go. And so Jesus, would you guide those who are fearful for what's next? God, we ultimately pray that everyone here would experience new resurrection life this morning in the powerful name of Jesus. And now God, we pray the Lord's prayer together that you taught your disciples to pray. Praying our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Well, let's stand and continue in worship. Yeah, as you're standing, we just want to invite us to come around a song that hails Jesus as the King. And I want to just invite us to go back to the cross and go back to the empty tomb to realize that we hail the King who conquered not with violent force, but with sacrificial love. 
And so we come before him and, and remember those moments and worship him now. There was a moment when the lights went out When death had claimed its victory The king of love had given up his life The darkest day in history There on the cross they made for sinners Every curse is blood atoned. One final breath and it was finished. But not the end we could have known. For the earth began to shake. And the veils of stone. One sacrifice was made in the heavens.
As we continue standing, would you all mind just extending your hands um, as I read an affirmation of faith over you? It's the Apostles' Creed, so if you know the words, feel free to say them with me. But we get to declare this morning these words. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. You can be seated. place in this church. Maybe you have been visiting family this weekend or you were dragged here by a significant other. Um, I know that to be true because some of you have said to me, Brian, I'm bringing so-and-so to church on Easter, which is code language for, so don't blow it, pastor. We started this morning with those sacred words that have been passed from one generation to the next through the centuries. It's our Easter anthem. He is risen indeed. One Easter morning, a, a dad walked into the kitchen and he said, boy, am I hungry. And his six-year-old son looked up from where he was sitting at the kitchen counter and he said, I am hungry indeed. And his dad said, son, are you making fun of what we say in church on Easter? And he said, no, daddy. But our Sunday school teacher said, if you really feel something, you should always say indeed. But we are indeed grateful, honored. Uh, so blessed to have you with us today and to celebrate with you that death is defeated, sins are forgiven, hope wins, hell loses because Christ is risen indeed. But see, before we get to the joy and the hope of the resurrection, we got to deal with an emotion, another emotion that's really front and center in this Easter story that was read for us moments ago. We're told by the gospel writer Mark that these three women, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and uh, Salome, these three women, uh, were going to the tomb very early on the first day of the week. Now, it's one of those details that we tend to sort of skim over to get to the good stuff, but very early, or dark 30, as Grandpa used to say. So Mark drops this little detail in, and you're Kind of wondering, well, like, thank you very much, Mark, for letting us know that Ma the Marys and Salome were morning people, early risers, go-getters, fully caffeinated, like everybody who went to the sunrise service already, and now they're done with church, and they just wanted to get an early start on their day, and, and they went to the tomb early. Is that what this is all about? No. They're headed to the tomb very early at daybreak because they're afraid that someone might see them. They're afraid that someone might notice that they're going to anoint the body of a condemned criminal because that's what Jesus was. He was convicted of inciting rebellion, an insurrectionist. These women were justifiably afraid of being connected to that, and so they went very early in the morning while it was still kind of dark. But if you keep peeling back the layers of this Easter story, it's a story loaded with fear, beginning with the fear that always surrounds death. The death of someone they loved, someone they pledged their lives to, and now he's in a grave. But then second, there's suffering and the fear that surrounds suffering. Uh, Mark tells us they were bringing with them spices to anoint Jesus' body. So they're not just going to the columbarium to pay their respects. No, this was a sacred Jewish ritual where they would unwrap the burial linens and anoint the corpse. A body that no doubt bears the scars and the reminders of all the torture and the crucifixion and how much Jesus suffered. That's what they're expecting to find. Death, suffering. And then think about third, the failure. 
Right? These women expected to find failure in that tomb. Just days after Jesus had, had ro- ridden into Jerusalem and he was celebrated like a king and now he's in a grave, which means their hopes had failed. He had failed. Even his followers had failed him, running away when they needed him most. Everyone, by the way, except for the women. Death, suffering, failure, and then fourth, they certainly would have expected to find shame. Crucifixion was the most shameful way to die. It was reserved for for slaves and the worst of death row criminals. Think about that. To be put on display as you're breathing your last. And here was their friend, the one that they thought was their savior, their king, the one who was coming to make all things right, and now he's been crucified in shame. Death, suffering, failure, shame. All these fears they expected to find in that graveyard. And are those not our four, four of our deepest fears as well, right? Starting with death, that's an easy one. Nobody likes to think about death, talk about death, acknowledge death, because we're all afraid of it. There was an article recently in the New York Times about the booming popularity of this thing called cryogenics. Anybody ever heard of that, cryogenics? It's, it's, it's when they freeze your body when you die so that, you know, 100 years later when they discover a way to to bring you back to life, you'll be able to go on living. And people have been paying hundreds of thousands of dollars for this, especially during the pandemic, which seems kind of steep, doesn't it? I mean, Han Solo didn't pay a dime for that, but, but that's our culture, right? We're afraid of death. Well, then there's suffering. We who will do anything to avoid pain in our lives. We see this all over the place. We spend so much time trying to avoid pain through addictions, entertainment, buying more stuff, right? Racking up achievements, anything we can do to dull the pain and the suffering that we hate. Or maybe it's the fear that's surrounding an illness or a bout with cancer or you're watching as as someone you love is, is, is not getting better and there's all kinds of fear around that. And then there's failure. Think about failure. So many of you, if you're anything like me, what drives you to try and succeed in life is the fear of failing. Right? We're afraid of, that we're going to fail others, that we're going to fail ourselves, people's expectations of us. We're afraid that we're going to fail God. Death, suffering, failure, and then shame. Shame is such an underrated emotion. Uh, last week, uh, Allie and I were uh, on a flight and on a plane, and I don't know if this has ever happened for any of you, but um, there's sort of this wisdom out there that when you're traveling by air, you ought to drink a lot of water so that you don't get dehydrated. It's sort of good for you. And, and um, so I decided before this morning flight that I would down two Nalgene's of water just to kind of be safe, make sure that I'm fully hydrated. Then I had my venti Starbucks on the way to the airport. And so we get to the airport. It's a morning flight. We board the plane. And half an hour in... I got to go. Like, you know, I'm start, I, I need to find a restroom, but, uh, but we're still sort of uh, going up into the air and the, you know, no, the, the captain hasn't turned off the whatever seatbelt sign. And they're pretty serious about that stuff these days. So you're supposed to follow the rules. So I'm sitting there sweating because I am fully hydrated, but I need a restroom. Well, finally, the captain comes on and, you know, he talks for a few minutes like captains often do. And he finally gets around to turning off the seatbelt sign. And before that, boom. I am already up out of my seat, like looking for the restroom. But the only problem is, what happens when you have to go to the restroom on a plane? That's when the drink cart comes out. And they're going down the aisle for half an hour, and that drink cart is between me and my restroom in the back of the plane. Well, I know that I'm not going to last that long, and so finally I decide that I'm going to make a run for it. I know that I'm not supposed to, but this was bladder crisis moment at this point. And so... Instead of waiting for the, you know, drink cart to go by, I decided to walk forward through the curtain, right? You know, the curtain that separates all of us in coach from the holy of holies, first class. And I know I'm not supposed to, but I am desperate. And so I'm, you know, walking forward and I kind of try to play it cool. Like I know what I'm doing. Like I belong in 2A. Well, as soon as I step through that curtain, I kid you not, this flight attendant steps right in front of me, and she says loud enough for everyone in first class to hear, she says, oh, no, sir, you cannot do that. And then she goes on to tell me that I am required by law, federal law at that, 
to use the restroom in my cabin, my class of service. And everybody in first class is like listening along and they're looking at me and they're like, busted. Don't be stealing any of our lavender scented towelettes. No, no, no. So then I have to make my way back to the, pl- back to the middle of the plane, this walk of shame, this slow walk of shame, and I have to wait there for the drink cart to pass by. Shame is a powerful emotion. I will never cross through the Holy of Holies again. Right, so often, I'm controlled by shame, a fear of what people might think, embarrassment. We live in the fear that, that someday people are going to see us for who we really are, and they are not going to like what they see. We're ashamed of our past, our mistakes, of regrets, the shame of a relationship gone bad, or a divorce, or an addiction that you're hiding from the people you love. Death, suffering, failure, shame, four of our biggest fears. So here's kind of the Easter question for every one of us today. When these three women came to that tomb on that first Easter morning, what did they find? They were expecting to find all this fear, but what did they find inside that tomb? Nothing. There's an angel standing there who says to them, he is not here. See the place where they laid him. And what do they see? Nothing. No death, no suffering, no failure, no shame. The tomb was empty. The resurrection of Jesus conquered our deepest fears, and that's good news for you and for me. And by the way, it isn't good news unless it's really true. Maybe some of you walked into this place today with questions. And if you're being honest, you're kind of skeptical that Easter is anything more than just this sentimental story we keep telling ourselves. Maybe one of the reasons you're not so sure about all this is you've kind of been turned off through the years by the church or what, by, by what church people sometimes say. That's why next week we're starting a series called, Did God Really Say That? Right? These are things that, that we think are in the Bible that are not actually in the Bible. And so if you ever overheard a conversation where somebody said, well, you know how it says in the good book, cleanliness is next to godliness, so you need to clean up your life. Or... When someone says, when God, you know how it says in the Bible, when God closes one door, he, what? Opens another one. Obviously, you've heard that before. Which, just to be clear, none of those things are in the good book. And so we'd love for you to join us as we seek to gain clarity about what the scriptures uh, really have to say, what God really has to say about life and how we walk through struggles together. Uh, maybe you're here and you've got lots of questions. You're not quite sure what it is that you believe. And let me just say this. Uh, If you're still trying to figure this out, I am so glad that you are here. And we want this to be a place where people can come and ask questions and and, and work through their doubts. There have been times in my life when I wondered whether any of this was really true. And I am so grateful that the church has made room for my doubts. And just to let you know, there's a little section in your worship guide where I've shared some of the reasons that I have confidence, growing confidence that the resurrection is, a, is an historically true event. And I'd encourage you to read through that, not right now, like during the sermon, but later when you're at brunch, at Sizzler, or wherever you, you could get a reservation. Uh, real quick, one of the most compelling pieces of evidence, at least for me, is that women were the first witnesses of that empty tomb. In the first century, if you committed a crime and a hundred women saw you do it, uh, but there was no man there, you would go free. Because women in that culture were, um, were kind of looked down upon and, and low in social status, and they were considered incapable of being reliable witnesses. If you were making this story up, there is no way that you would put women there at the tomb first, which all four gospel writers do. And one of these women, we're told, was Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene, whose background check would always get rejected because of her checkered past, right? Possessed by demons. That'll get you flagged every time. Okay, point being... This was about the least likely candidate in the New Testament to be the first witness of the empty tomb. Best possible explanation for why women, why Mary Magdalene is described as finding the empty tomb first is that's how it happened and they couldn't bring themselves to alter the true story. So this isn't just good news, it's true news. And if it's true, then we have nothing to fear. All their fears were defeated. 
Not that they no longer exist, but what the empty tomb announces is that fear does not have the last word. Those fears do not have power over us anymore because God has shown us that he will take those things and he will use them for good. The empty tomb shows us that that God can defeat death by raising Jesus from the dead and he's going to do the same thing for us. Easter shows us that God has defeated suffering because Jesus suffered and absorbed the worst pain the world has to offer on our behalf and we know that when we suffer, he, he, he is our comforter and he is our help and he suffers with us. In the empty tomb, we see that God took what looked like ultimate failure, ultimate shame, his own son dying on a wooden cross and God transformed that into victory so that we are forgiven and we will live forever as sons and daughters of the king. Therefore, we have nothing to fear because that tomb is empty. This is where you're supposed to say amen. Fear does not get the last word. Now, some of you may be thinking, wait a second, that's not what I heard when that passage was read just a little bit ago. In fact, when we got to the, you know, this is the word of the Lord, thanks be to God, you're like, wait a second, no, you got to keep going, you're leaving out some verses. How could it end like that? Look again at the last verse in the Gospel of Mark, Mark 16, 8. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb, and they said nothing to anyone. Because they were afraid. End of gospel. So isn't fear like the actual last word? Now, some of you who've brought your own Bibles or you have that uh, pew Bible open in front of you, and you were reading along, and when we got to the end of verse 8, you were like, hold on, my Bible just keeps on going. What about verses 9 through 20? So here's the bonus part of the Easter sermon. If you have a newish Bible, in just about every modern translation, verses 9 through 20 are in italics, or there should be a big, bold heading above verses 9 through 20 saying, the earliest manuscripts end at verse 8. Most scholars think the original authentic version, uh, the authentic ending of Mark's gospel was verse 8, not verses 9 through 20. And I'll try to show you why. You ever watched a movie or a TV series, and you got to the series finale, and it was like a total bummer, like complete letdown, terrible ending, and you're like, I want my money back. That was the worst ending in history. And if you look this up, shows like Seinfeld or Lost or Game of Thrones is a recent one. Not that anyone in church has ever watched that before, but, but it's an ending where you're like, what? That can't be the ending. That, it can't end there. Like, there's got to be another episode here. My favorite example of this is from the classic movie Princess Bride. And you might remember this. It's when the grandpa, Columbo, you know, he's uh, reading to his grandson and, and they're going through the book and, and suddenly he stops like one page from the end, one paragraph from the end of the book. And his grandson, Fred Savage, is like, wait a second, grandpa, you, you can't just stop before it ends. And Columbo says to him, well, I didn't think you liked any of that, you know, romantic kissy stuff. And young Fred Savage says, well, maybe I like some of the kissy stuff after all. And so the grandpa opens up the book and he reads the last paragraph. And if you remember, it's just this classic line and this classic ending. He says, since the invention of the kiss, there have been five kisses rated the most passionate. And this one left them all behind. And we're all like, yes. That's how it's supposed to end. Well, it's kind of that way with Mark's gospel. And it's because of that, this longing for resolution, that later manuscript writers, because back then every copy of the Bible had to be written in hand. There was no printing press or digital versions. And and so there would be copiers, transcribers of the Bible who would come to the end of Mark's gospel and they would say, wait a second, that can't be the ending. We got to make it sound better. We got to give it a better ending. And so they would add different endings, and that's what we have with verses 9 through 20. Does that make sense? Later Christians who were trying to resolve the tension that Mark leaves us with in his original ending. And so the question remains, how could Mark's Easter story end in fear? Like, the last word is literally fear. They were afraid. And I'll tell you why I love this ending. Part of it is, it's, it's so real. Like, it doesn't try to airbrush over real life 
or try to resolve so much of the reality of these fears that are still, they're still there. That just because Jesus conquered death doesn't mean our lives are suddenly void of anything we could ever be afraid of. And think about all we've been through together these last couple years, a global pandemic, so many lives lost, racial tensions, families and friends torn apart by division and hate. Now this senseless war in Ukraine. And that's not even mentioning just the everyday ongoing realities of struggling through sickness and loneliness and despair. And see, Mark's gospel ending doesn't gloss over any of this. But I think even more than that, the reason that I'm so drawn to this ending, it's as if for Mark, the real ending to this gospel story is what we do in response to the empty tomb. It's almost like Mark and the, and the Spirit of God through Mark is saying to the first listeners and readers of his gospel and all the way through history to those of us who are reading and listening to it today, Mark says, I know how the story ends. I've seen the faith and the courage of these three women who were overcome with fear in that morning, and I know they would go on to tell the story of the empty tomb, and they would become pillars of this Jesus movement that would, would go on, and they would risk everything because they had met the risen Christ. They would leave everything behind. Some of them would lose their families. Many of them would lose their lives because what seemed like silence as those women fled the empty tomb It was actually the beginning of a revolution. And I'll close with this. In 2004, uh, during the election in Ukraine, there was a reformer by the name of Viktor Yashchenko who challenged the establishment party. And as some of you may remember, it's a pretty powerful story. He was poisoned uh, in the months leading up to the election and almost died, but he survived. Well, on election day, All of the exit polls showed that Yushchenko had a huge lead, like he was going to win by a landslide. But through blatant fraud, the government that was in power reversed the results. And so later that evening, the state-run TV network uh, reported to, to the nation of Ukraine that Yushchenko had lost. But there was one thing they didn't take into account. This is a true story. In the lower right-hand corner of that Uh, TV screen as the state-run network was sharing the news that night of the election, there was a brave woman who was doing sign language translation of the news. And during the broadcast, she started to sign. As they were talking about how Yushchenko had lost, she started to sign, don't believe them. They're lying. Yushchenko is the president. Now, no one in that studio, that new studio, understood her sign language. They just assumed that she was kind of doing her thing, following along. But deaf people all over Ukraine started texting their friends, and their friends started texting their friends, and the word began to spread. And soon, courageous journalists began speaking out, and they got courageous. And eventually, there were a million people flooding the streets. And the government of Ukraine finally caved in, and and, and Yushchenko became president. What seemed like silence was actually the start of a revolution. Okay, that's Easter. Between Friday and Sunday, something happened that caused this band of defeated quitters who ran in fear when Jesus was arrested and when he was killed. Something happened in that empty tomb that these three women and later on even those washed out disciples would launch a movement that would change history. People overcome with fear were somehow changed almost overnight into women and men of unthinkable courage because the tomb was empty. They could stare at death, what once sent them running in fear and they would live with such boldness, such power, such resolve, such hope. They stopped trembling in fear and they started running with joy to share the story and the good news of the empty tomb and the world has never been the same. Because they knew the one who said, I love you and I've come down from heaven for you and I will fight for you and even when you turn your back on me, I will come back for you and I will overcome whatever it takes, even the grave, even death, to win you back to me. So how about you? Maybe some of you are here today and you might be ready to say, fear doesn't have to get the last word in my life and in my story anymore. I want the risen Jesus, his forgiveness, and his love to be the beginning and the ending of my story. 
And I know we don't do this very often because, you know, we're the frozen chosen Presbyterians, but sometimes there is just power in acknowledging when God stirs in us and does something to change us. And I wonder if for some of you, when you think back over the last year or the last couple years and all that we've been through together, something happened, something changed, and Jesus became the center of your story. His love, his forgiveness, his presence became more real to you than it's ever been before. Maybe you're a confirmation student or maybe you grew up in the church or you were baptized way back when, but it's like something happened in this season of life that maybe after a time of kind of keeping God at a distance, Jesus has become a part of your story. And if that's true for you, whether it's something that has happened for the first time for you, like it did at sunrise, as so many people stood up, or, or maybe you, you look back over this last couple years, this recent season, the last few months or years, and you just recognize there is something, maybe even in the struggles and the darkness of what you've had to go through, that God showed up. And because of Jesus, you have found hope and courage and trust that you never knew before. Maybe for you, it's like, I just, I know that that's happened in recent months or years, but I, I need an anniversary. And I need a day that I can remember, like that was the day, Easter Sunday, and I'll never forget, that was the moment when, when I went public and I stood up and I let people know Jesus has changed my life and I have put my trust in him. And if that's true for you, whether you're in Elliott Hall um, or you're right here in the sanctuary, I want to ask if you'd be willing just to stand for a moment. Just to stand so we can celebrate you. Would you be willing to stand if that's true for you? Thank you. Thank you. So King Jesus, we join our voices together. We thank you that you are still in the business of bringing dead stuff back to life. We thank you for your forgiveness which washes over our sins and makes us clean and whole. We pray that on this Resurrection Sunday that we would find our life and our fulfillment and our truest identity in trusting you and what you did for us 2,000 years ago. And we pray this, every one of us on this Resurrection Sunday, joyfully, boldly, in the name of the one who gave his life for us. And everybody said together, amen. 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 Would you all stand with us as we turn that prayer into a song this morning? In the darkness we were waiting without hope without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt
Till that stone was moved for good For the land of conquered dead And the dead rose from their tombs And the angels stood in awe For the souls of all who come To the Father all restored Come on, church! And the church of Christ was born so grateful that you've joined us uh, for this Easter Sunday celebration. Uh, thank you for your willingness to, um, to be a part of what God is doing here at Highland Park Prez. And if this is your first time, we hope that it won't be your last. In fact, we'd love for you to come back next Sunday. Uh, following our 11 o'clock worship gatherings, we'll have a big lunch on the front lawn. And we'd love for you to get to know some people, get connected to our church community um, after uh, worship services next Sunday. What seemed like silence was actually the beginning of a revolution. So as we go from this place, as you go from this place, um, I don't know what you're facing or dealing with or what burden you're shouldering right now. Uh, maybe it seems a little bit like there's silence on the other end of those prayers, those longings for God to show up, to bring resolution, uh, to bring peace. Know that he is at work. Know that he is at work even in the silence that the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is at work within each of us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Have a great Easter. <laughs>